Take it away, Nick. <laughs> Thanks, Reggie. Thanks, Reggie. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm Nick. Um, thanks for joining us I'm talking about product market fit. I know it's kind of a buzzword, you know, it's easy to communicate, um, you know, what it is that we're going to be talking today with that phrase, product market fit, product market pull, as Raj Nation mentioned, um, all similar things. I, I think a lot of people might think it's kind of for marketing, maybe it's just UX. Um, maybe some folks are looking for like a growth hack thing, or maybe just sales ops. This is what we do before all of that, or that's what I think of as being kind of a foundational thing that fuels all the rest. Um, and, and, and put simply, it's just like listening to the right person and asking the right questions. Uh, but what I'm going to do is start by just introducing myself, sharing a little bit about my background, um, why this is about days. And then we'll go through a little slide deck. Um, at different points during the slide deck, I might ask you to come off mute. Um, might ask you to send some messages in the chat. Um, and I might be screen sharing a couple of different examples uh, to, to make things a little clearer along the way. Um, OK, so I've started a few companies. My background's in design. Uh, I call myself a founder first, though. And uh, one of the companies I've started it is currently doing, it has a nine-figure valuation, employs more than 100 folks, and they haven't even reached their Series A yet. Um, and, and there's a story past before then um, of a lot of failures, small successes. And what I've been doing for the last couple of years is taking all the things I've learned about pivoting and switching um, directions, when to quit uh, something or put something down, when to reinvest, um, all important skills, I think, for founders to have. And when, when I started this, our, our venture studio for the Faster, uh, my partners and I all kind of galvanized around this single point that if you understand how to uh, figure out your product market fit flywheel, um, you're more likely to succeed than, than those that don't. So appreciate you all for coming. Um, and, and I hope you leave with a couple of little nuggets and some wisdom. All right, here I go. Any questions, anything I'm forgetting, Raju, before I, I dive into things? No, just to remind everybody and uh, use the chat if you have questions along the way, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll help run that so you can focus on doing you and giving the information out. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, cool. So the first thing we're going to talk about is like the mindset and some, some things that I think people misunderstand about product market fit in my, in my view. Um, then we'll talk about research methodologies specifically, like surveys and interviews. Then we'll talk a little, a little bit about prototyping. And I don't think we'll have enough time to really talk about development or um, organizing and prioritizing feature sets, but I've got a little framework that I'll leave you with that I hope is valuable for everyone. Um, all right, so first things first. This is you know largely designed for founders, but I, I like to say it's, it's for the founder's mindset. So if you take ownership over a product or a service that you're working on or for a company you're working for, um, consider this for you as well. But I will, I will be saying founders the whole time. So just internalize that, make, make, make that your own. I feel like founders need to be leading uh, in, in, our, in our studio. I have found that founders who lead from the product mindset understand um, the users better and understand how to connect that to development and future sets. So it's really about the founder's mindset. A lot of folks will try to ask someone to come in, maybe a CPO for hire or a product manager and offload this product market fit work to them. But if you're early on in an idea and especially over the life cycle of your company, it's really important that you understand these, these processes as well. Get a few under your belt and then offload it, but don't ignore it completely. It's important for you to internalize uh, just, as, just as a leader. Um, I, I think that there are three key, oh, there's a spelling error there on the right. Sorry about that. Um, there are three key um, components of the, 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 the product market fit mindset. One is an interest in a problem and not a solution. One of the biggest errors I see founders making when they do attempt to do some interviews or reach out to customers is they start with selling. Um, they don't really listen and, and open up and ask general questions. They're like, what do you think about this solution? And they ask their friends um, a lot of times. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into better ways to do all that, but 
do your best to fall in love with a problem area and not necessarily a solution set or a specific idea. That'll allow you to always be exposed to, to something that could be the biggest idea, you know, and, 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 and keep you from going down uh, rabbit holes and, and ignoring potential opportunities. The best way to fall in love with the problem is by listening to that market deeply. Um, when you start the process of surveying and interviewing, you're going to get a lot of information. And that's, I think, a big fear of folks. It's like, how do I sift through this? And, and what we do is, is put it on um, a scale, a pain scale, so that we start working with uh, the, the, the pain points that are the highest. And oftentimes that happen earliest in the journey. So that's a quick tip. If you're not sure where to start or where to be focusing your energies, go, go for the highest pain point and the one that's earliest in the journey to start with. I think we might need a muter on, on this. Forgive me. Thanks. Um, and then the second is this kind of iterative design or this kind of Slavic or Russian word, iterative design that I have here on the presentation. Um, iterative design is about uh, proving, proving yourself wrong um, and constantly changing uh, the, 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 the assumptions that you're making. It's a feeling. I remember, um, not to be too illicit, but there's, there's a judgment that was made by, by an older judge on, on pornography. And, and it went something like, if you, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, the same thing is the case for product market fit. You'll try to convince yourself that you have fit, and I see this a lot, but here are three things that for sure are strong litmus tests. One, customers can't get enough of it. Um, your, your pace and growth is outpacing your supply, whether that's time for, for you or uh, servers, or if it's a physical product, uh, your inventory, that's, that's definitely a strong indicator. When customers are spontaneously telling others or instructing them on how to use your product, that's a really strong uh, indicator of product market fit. And the third is you're hiring super fast uh, to keep up with the growth. I think when folks raise venture funding and they hire fast, they also kind of use that as an indicator that they're succeeding but they just actually took on a bunch of debt and hopefully they're using that capital wisely. So it's um, mostly revenue driven growth here on that third, that third indicator. Can I add something on this, Nick? Please, yeah, that'd be great. So specifically that second point of customers spontaneously telling others, I think like what's really important in this is like, so I, I, my version of looking at this, and I think about how when we create content at Startup Hype, and the way I phrase it is, I call it can't sleep content. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what I mean by that is, how do you make your content so interesting, so different, so memorable that the person who has interacted with it can't go to sleep that night until they've told someone else about it? And I share that anecdote to say, like, what you're saying here with, with customers spontaneously tell others I just don't want anyone to mince like, it doesn't mean that they're like cash, like, oh yeah, you should maybe check out this thing sometime. It's that like, they pretty much cannot go to bed that day unless they have told someone else about it. And that's, that I think, and you can clarify, I think is the difference between like, you know, product market semi-adoption versus real stickiness. Absolutely. It's probably the most, the strongest, I would say yes. And it's important when you're designing your product from the ground up to think about that referral cycle, make it easy for, for people to, to tell others. And if you want to get crazy with it, create incentives, um, set up s different types of incentive structures. I, I think the most popular one that we all know, uh, give one, get one, um, you know, referral codes and things. Think creatively. There's, there's others, the other ways out there. Um, but that can superficially inflate uh, this metric in, in, in particular. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a balance between the product mechanics, but also the evangelization um, from your user, user base, like you said, Roger. One thing that folks misunderstand, I think, as well, um, is that at, at the early onset of your product's development um, or release, you test it, you find the fit, and then it's just a rocket ship from there. Um, and, and, and the reality is, is that it's, it's cyclical. Uh, the market changes, your customer needs change, competitions come in, 
um, and, and is disrupting, you know, your your pipeline or your revenue opportunities. Um, so there's things are constantly shifting, and it's really important to to think of this as an engine that's moving cyclically in the background. Um, that cycle has roughly three stages, and we can debate what those stages are, but I like to keep it simple. The first that we're going to talk about is converting an assumption into a hypothesis and that and listing your, your assumptions so you have hypotheses like a backlog of hypotheses to be testing and then moving that that hypothesis into a, a, a specific testing cycle um, which is that design and, and prototype and user testing components i i singled out this one and i've, I've debated this with my partners a bunch but like I didn't want to leave this first one out because it's so important when you're teaching this or, or sharing this with, with someone that's not familiar with design and iterative thinking and design thinking. Every, you know, most founders think that, that you have to be super dedicated and obsessed about you know, a particular idea. And you do need a lot of energy and uh, a lot of commitment. And it's, it's also our curse, right? It's our downfall that we we focus too much on certain things. And so what, what, one thing that's really been helpful for us is creating um, a set of assumptions um, that you can begin your scientific process from. And there's a quick stat here from Adam Grant's book, Think Again, that shows that folks, you know, businesses that pivot 20 to 30% more are more likely to generate revenue over time. So it's important to constantly be thinking about your business model in a, in a, in a scientific way. And so here's, here's our first activity for the day. Um, grab your phone or your, your note app, if you're still using Evernote, or if you love to use um, you know, real notepads, just grab that piece of, of paper and, and just write assumptions, just create a new note and write assumptions on, as the name of that note. And I want you to write down an assumption that you're currently holding about your product or service. I'm gonna give us a couple of seconds. And this is for you for later, right? So the, the, the purpose of this is to be a part of a system where you've, where you, that you've created of alarm bells that go off when, you, when an assumption comes to mind or when someone comes your direction with an idea and it's riddled with assumptions. You've got now a mechanism that isn't about opinion. You're like, I'm gonna add that to our assumptions list. Great, great thought, great idea, um, great management tactic. And as part of this you know, uh, system of alarm bells, you have to, you have to choose, figure out which of those assumptions you wanna start with. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a quick formula here. So once you have the assumptions list, um, and if anyone wants to throw some assumptions into the chat, I would encourage that. Um, one of my assumptions here is uh, founders care a lot about product market fit. That's foundational to this presentation. <laughs> and some founders might not. Um, and, and honestly, I'm not really interested in talking to them. So that's why I put presentations on like this and share this with as many people as I can because it, it, it's attracting the type of folks that I'm interested in talking to, that folks that are that care about product market fit are obsessed like, like I am or want to be. Um, so once you have your assumption and you have your persona, you have, a, you have an understanding of um, who the person is that is affected by that assumption, you also want to consider the business impact. So you'll see these three, it's kind of like a little mad lib I created here. It's, you don't have to use this, but these are critical ingredients in a strong product hypothesis. So, so what we've done so far is set up an assumptions list that you're going to create a backlog of assumptions. And then one day you're like, I've got time to test one of these assumptions or you're, 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 you're ready to, to begin your scientific uh, you know, testing process. You're going to take that assumption and plug it into this formula. So for me, for my assumption, right, I, I haven't included the persona in my, in my assumption is that founders, so we believe that product market fit, my assumption, is important for founders to know and will increase the number of founders I get to work with and businesses I invest in. 
and the success of those businesses, in fact. And here's another example down here for a telemedicine company. And I'm gonna ask you all to, to throw out your product hypotheses in a second. So start getting typing. So for this telemedicine company we worked with, we believe that certain medical appointments and consults, and they got really specific about those after our work together, um, for people who can't leave their house, which was a large market recently, uh, will result in more telemedicine appointments on our app. And that's, that's their business impact. So go ahead and throw some more in here into the chat that's relevant to your business. And that'll help us uh, create a little conversation, maybe dive into things a little deeper uh, in the future. We've got a few in here. So we've got Demondrick saying, travel is the gateway to personal finance is an assumption. Kendra says, founders are open to constructive slash critical feedback. I wrote, I put an assumption, startup founders want to raise money. Kevin yep. says, there's an apparent conflict between consulting and advisory units. Uh, between our consulting advisory units is a paradox almost non-existent in practice. Jim said, more information is critical for constructing diets and meal planning. Amazing. Shelley, people care about their mental health. And actually, DJ took your framework, Mondra took your framework and updated it and said, we believe that travel is the gateway to personal finance for people in their 20s and will result in helping people build good financial habits like saving. And it kind of forces you, great work, everybody. Those are all excellent um, assumptions and hypotheses. What this forces you to do is take your assumptions, choose who it's for, and oftentimes you should be also prioritizing for your team of which persona that you're, you know, you're focusing on. You might have several people that are buying your service or um, are influence the buying of your service that you'll want to understand and build products and services for in the future. Um, so this helps you focus that persona, prioritize that, understand the assumption, and then directly tie it to a business impact. A lot of times assumptions will just be cataloged and we'll just be like, yeah, that's an assumption. You take it for granted and it affects all these business uh, angles and units. And we don't even realize it. If you're not sure where to start, um, which assumption to start with, I, I would recommend making a list, uh, at least 10. Push yourself to write a lot of the assumptions that your business is riding on and who the people are that they're affecting. At some point from that list of 10 or 20, what we call a keystone assumption will arise. And a keystone assumption is the, the assumption that your business will fail at if you get wrong, right? And that's what, that's what you had mentioned before, Rajiv, right? For, for Startup Headman, it's vital for you to be talking only to people that are raising or want to raise in the future so that they're feeling prepared, right? Right. You know, question for you, Nick, and I'm, I'm, I'm going off of what I'm seeing in the chat here. Please. When we create those that assumption, right, in that framework, we believe blank for blank will result in blank. Is the fill in the blanks of that supposed to be like, we believe our product will do this? So like uh, specifically what I'm looking at is one of them is that we had submitted here was, we believe that creating a crypto platform for millennial women and moms will result in more women buying crypto and close the crypto gender gap. So is should an assumption be like, we believe that our product or should it be something else? We, we kept it general on purpose um, because this formula is for the egotistical entrepreneur. <laughs> right? we, we, it's the blessing and the curse. All of us delude ourselves into thinking we can bring something into the world that doesn't exist. And that takes a lot of ego. Hmm. And by, by calling this, uh, you know, the, 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 a scientific formula and, and by calling the, that part of the formula assumption-based instead of product-based or feature-based, it really takes this and fights against. We found that like this, this is the, the you know, defense against one of the best defenses against ego and, and myopic kind of focus. Love it. And if you can bring this to the culture, right? If this is for a founder that's on the early part of their journey and they build their company based off of this process and this mentality, then every hire after them, right? Everyone they bring into the team and, and build that organizational culture over time is also going to be thinking of everything as assumptions that they question. 
And then that forces everyone who's making decisions in the company to defend those assumptions in some way or another. And when that begins, tests start to arise. And that's what we'll talk about next. So you've got a few different ways of gathering data. We're going to talk about primary research first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into secondary research. Primary research is what I, I, I live in the church of primary research. I believe you cannot, there's no substitute for talking to the people that are impacted by your process. And there's a, a, few, a few different ways to do that, but we'll just go through two. Surveys and interviews. Those are the most popular. Let's not get too complicated. Um, and we'll go through into detail uh, here for each. Okay. So one more quick survey of the crew. I'm gonna ask for you to write which of these tactics you've done in the past or maybe are currently doing. There's a few different types of validation tactics, right? We've got the surveys, we've got the interviews, but then you go deeper into the secondary research um, as well, right? Marketing competitive analysis. Or maybe you're getting a test out there in a way that's interactive through a landing page or a prototype or a mock-up of something. What have, what, what have you all used in your process of validating uh, some new ideas in the past? Jess, I love it. Just bringing the whole suite to bear. It's amazing. Would you lump if it wasn't like form? So I'm just thinking back to the you know, five, six years ago when I started Startup Hype Man. And I'm thinking like, it wasn't like formal user interviews, but I was paying close attention in a lot of conversations I was having. So how does that yes. fit into this? Or is that maybe not the method that one should go? It, it does not, yeah. So, so and, and I don't fault you at that for, for at all. Um, I, do, I do that sometimes as well, depending on how formal we wanna get behind it. But if you're, if you're raising money and you're building a company, you're gonna spend a decade or more of your life on something, I would definitely go the formal route. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what I think you were sharing and, and things I've done in the past as well is kind of like learning while selling. And that's great too. Like that works if you're, if you know, I would, in, in addition to that, I would bring in some more formal uh, tactics as well. Because what, what oftentimes we, we see is we start with really formal stuff and we build our assumption base to have enough confidence and then start getting it out into the world and selling. And then that learning cycle comes into play. Then we get fatigued and we can't really keep you know, everyone's opinions different from each other and we have to go back into a formal process. And so it's, that's, that's the cycle and the, the benefit of having this engine kind of in the background. That's great, thanks. Yeah, it holds the whole, your whole team accountable to a certain sense of excellence and rigor that decays really quickly in startups. So a, a dovetail, a question that dovetails off of that from Shelly is, Founders are used to being convicted and assertive re their gut, especially while selling early on. How do you acknowledge and talk about assumptions without it seeming like you're just doubting your gut instincts? I love you for asking that question. Um, it's hard. It, 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 it's hard to do that from the outside, right? Like I was saying, th this this presentation is great for founders because they're the core of the culture. Um, moving forward. So if you can get this right as a founder, you're actively building that culture in your business. If you're not the founder, tell them to come to this presentation. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I think also try to use some of the arguments that I'm bringing to bear throughout this presentation that data is super important, how this affects organizational culture as the company grows to 10, 20, 50, 100 employees, thousands of employees. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, I think one of the more powerful things in that line of thinking is how autonomous the organization can be at large, right? You can have thousands of employees who are running tests or business, hundreds of business units or small teams and pods that are, that are carrying out this level of work really fast in disparate departments and, and ways, as long as the method um, for getting to an answer it is agreed upon. And a gut reaction centralizes all of the decision-making power to the person who holds that gut. <laughs> and then their time is limited as their, as their company grows. And the gut becomes 
overextended and they can't have an opinion on everything. Um, and so if you really want to build a company that, that can scale and grow over time, we need to find methods and standard operating procedures, which I know you love, Shelly, um, that can scale with us. Um, so I forgot to actually talk about this slide, sorry. Okay, so surveys, um, <laughs> surveys you can, um, you know, gather quantitative data as well as qualitative data. And I'll go into the specifics about how to do each of those things. User interviews are great for qualitative work, not for quantitative stuff. Um, but it it's so emotive. You can hear the tone and timbre of someone's voice when they walk through something. If, if we're dealing with really difficult things, like, um, you know, I just did a, a survey recently and interviews recently um, around the birthing journey and, and pregnancy, and it can get really emotional at, at, at times. Things that don't come through during surveys or landing page tests. And so, uh, you know, user interviews are indispensable when you're trying to understand the human at the end, the other end of your product or service. Another type of interview to hold is with a subject matter expert, right? There's tons of people out there that have either done the work you're doing. Educational Zoom meeting I'm in at the same need. time, and I'm like, Go. Um, I wonder where that going, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, subject matter expert interviews are super uh, as an alternative to, to user interviews. They've been through what you've done, you've been through before. Um, and just quick secret: we love to do subject matter expert interviews as a way to court venture capitalists, like people who are doing investment, because they understand the market really well and can be used as experts. Um, or advisors, people who we want to bring onto our advisory board in the future. It's, a, it's like an earnest way of getting in touch with these folks that doesn't feel, um, you know, uh, malicious or anything. Um, marketing competitive analysis, we've got some fun uh, tools to go through there. Landing pages, whatever your tool is of choice, um, get something out there for people to react to. Um, and then prototypes and mock-ups, like take it a step further, get them into uh, the, the moment that they're hitting the button or making the decision. Um, and you can go as low in fidelity as paper prototypes of boxes or as high fidelity as, you know, you know, mock-ups that really look like a product using a design system or something. With mock-ups and prototypes, if you do go that angle, I recommend going high fidelity because it oftentimes, um, elicits a stronger reaction. And we'll go deeper into that in a second as well. Okay. Got a question from Kevin on surveys specifically. So actually maybe why don't you talk through it and then we'll, we'll see if that answers his question. It does, it does indeed. And so I'm just gonna do a quick share of a survey um, with that product that I was mentioning before. So this is a, a survey that we sent out to 230 women um, and, and individuals identifying as women that ask them about their experience giving birth uh, and expecting. Would you mind just like zooming in on the page a little bit more? Yes. Awesome. Well, no doubt. Um, when designing surveys, I think it's really important for you to consider a, a, a really balanced lens and try to remove the bias. And I think this, is, this speaks to your question, Kevin. Every, every question you write should be really thoughtful and probably reviewed by someone else with a different background than you. Um, not everyone is, it, it, a lot of times entrepreneurs will create services and things that uh, are for them, you know, driving their own, their own problem. And, that, and that's great. It's also important to, to, and vital because there's other opinions at the table for you to consider uh, perspectives outside of your own. And surveys are a really great way of doing that. Um, so after, you know, so, well, during this, during the survey, you'll see a few different things, variety of um, background and information being collected about the person up front, uh, so we can get a sense for their perspective and where they're coming from and their life experience. Um, sensitive questions are asked, so we have to be uh, you know, really conscious of how we phrase certain answers so that they're not emotionally triggering or re-traumatizing. Re um, so language is super important. Um, 
And, and you'll notice that there's different types of responses, uh, response formats. Some of them, a lot of them are multiple choice, but a lot of times they'll be open answer or they'll be rank choice. Um, and by diversifying the type of questions you're asking, you'll, uh, you'll be more certain about the answers you get. So I would recommend answering the same question in two different formats. So you can gut check between uh, participants and even within part like a single participant. Uh, it, it's, you know, research methodologies are tricky. There's a, um, so on this note of like how you're asking the questions and what information you're trying to find, I, I saw someone's talk a few weeks ago who was showing like, you know, latest methods and in information collection and survey methodology. And they took this screenshot of someone's like joke response and it was like from Microsoft and it was a product feedback survey. <laughs> And the question, like the final question of the survey was on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to, um, uh, to recommend Windows whatever to a friend? And the person's response was like, I don't know what world you live in where you think when I get together with friends, I talk about operating systems. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I, and I think that that's, that's uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to go into with the the, the net promoter score methodology, um, and I, I I can I can share some stuff at the end, uh, some cool links around some good debates, some healthy debates around that. Uh, yeah, okay. please. So here are some quick tips on designing great surveys. No leading questions. Um, so if there's a value um, in your question, like good, bad, enjoy. Uh, didn't enjoy, hate, especially hyperbolic language, you're writing a leading question. So make sure that your question does not have values or strong values, especially in them, right? So you want to be asking open-ended questions like, what was your experience like? Please describe your experience as you recalled it. Um, expectations are important as well when you're, when you're, um, uh, starting a survey. If, if you're collecting sensitive information, letting people know that you won't be sharing that information helps with people's honesty and their, the, the quality of response, as well as their comfort. Um, so it's just important to re respect people that you're asking for information from. It's very valuable stuff and they're being very generous with their opinions and time. So it's important to recognize that. Speaking of being <laughs> respectful of, of their time, try to keep things short. We, we like to keep our surveys, especially when they're, um, you know, remote uh, and not in person, but also when they're in person, uh, keeping, it, keeping it short is really important. 10 to 15 questions, um, optimizing for, 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 for speed is helpful. Simple language, avoiding any jargon that might be confusing to folks, something that makes sense to you as a founder or someone who's really immersed in the space, your audience might not know exactly what you're talking about. So it's important to you know, test these surveys with, with people um, that have that lens ahead of time to try to expose those, those terms. Um, don't ask more than one question at a time. Uh, a, a lot of people, especially in interview scripts, will, say, will ask like three questions. It's like, so how did you feel about your visit to the grocery store and which aisle did you pick first? And it's like, I don't know which question to answer first or which one is more important. So, it's super important to ask only one question at a time. That's a, that's a pitfall that a lot of folks will fall into. And then Likert scales are great. Um, if you filled out a survey, you've seen these a million times. Yes, Samantha, I, I like Google Form. Um, it's, it's easiest for us because the rest of our operating suite is in Google. On that note of asking like one thing at a time, a great way to like get better at that is listen to how good podcast hosts um, run their shows and they very rarely if ever will ask some convoluted question to get an answer it's usually a pretty simple I mean the the information they can gather can be very deep but they can do that by asking a simple question that just has like a response you know that that they're trying to generate I think in you know a good journalists um, are, are kind of artists in, in, in rhetoric and, 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 and hosts as well, just um, can elicit the question, the response, like Jen Psaki was great at not, you know, responding to someone's question 
that they you know wanted her to respond to and 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 terry gross my favorite interviewer it, on, on npr is you know so great at asking open-ended questions that are really insightful and emotionally like relevant to the person and where they're at in their story at that specific time um so i i love that rajiv the the idea of like nerding out and, and studying the way that people ask questions so you can reflect on it yourself sometimes uh surveys are hard to get responses like you you you, you know Go ahead, quick raise of hands if you sent out a survey and didn't get more than like a you know a handful of responses or didn't get enough responses for those surveys uh, to be statistically significant. Exactly. So I think one way of dealing with that is um, incentivizing these. And, and there's a, a few different ways you can do it. If you're going to um, approach a professional organization that, that you're asking, let's say uh, we're reaching out to facility managers um, and it's really hard to get in touch with facility managers because they don't like spend a lot of time online. They're managing their buildings all the time. They're not on LinkedIn. So what we did was asked a professional group, um, the International Facility Management Association, uh, to distribute our survey amongst their members in return for the data that we generated from it. So that's an incentive for the group to share the survey, not necessarily for the survey person to participate in it, but for us to broaden the audience with which we're getting exposure to. So think about ways of incentivizing the folks that are sharing your survey as well. And then for people that are actually giving your you know, time, um, we find one of the most effective and cost effective as well is, is enter to win. So you just get a raffle, you select one of the people or 10 of the people that have uh, participated in your survey to get a gift card or something along those lines. So it's, it's not every response is paid, but it incentivizes folks enough to just take that five minutes from their day. Always wanna to try to get some contact info, but you also don't want to make folks uncomfortable. So I would, oftentimes recommend people to not make contact info required, but definitely ask for it. And then um, to make sure you're asking the right people the right questions, uh, a screener questionnaire ahead of time or qualifying questions at the top or somewhere in the survey itself is super helpful, right? So if I'm, if I'm out there talking to facility managers, one of the screener questions I need to put in there is, are you a facility manager? <laughs> And if they say no, then they're removed from, you know, our, our data set. All right, now we'll, now we'll talk a little bit about interviews. Any questions on surveys and all those tactics before I dive into the interview section? Feel free to ask them in the, in the chat or go ahead and take yourself off mute. I'd love to hear some voices. I think what's interesting with this is I, I just almost summarize some of what you've been saying, like how you ask can literally make or break the product you end up building. That's correct. That's exactly right, Reggie. The questions you ask, you get the answers you get. Um, so ask the right questions. That's, that's, our, that's our methodology for sure. And there's a whole science around how to ask the right questions, luckily. So you know, it's not like you're you're left in in a, a, a pit of misery and despair and mystery. It's clear ways of of doing this stuff. Recording in progress. Awesome. So, one thing that we'll want to do is, uh, for for after we've done the surveys, there's a good there's a good chance that you'll want to reach out to and speak to some of the folks that have responded to that survey. We recommend six. There's a little bit that have been done um, on the number of participants you need to interview in order to get reasonable feedback. A lot of folks think it's 10, 20, more is better, but really there's a plateau of a curve. Um, I forget what this is. Is this an asymmetric curve? Where it plateaus? Any mathematicians online? Um, but it plateaus. After about six, the number of insights you're gathering starts to diminish. So you might, in, in interviews seven through 20, you might learn two or three more things. And it's really just not worth your time interviewing seven through 20 if you've got, you know, 80%, 90% uh, 
through with your one through six. So we're all about speed, hence the name uh, of the company. So we're all about, you know, moving on, gathering stuff as fast as possible. And that number for us is six. It's important before you share your screener for the interview or, you know, sending out the, the survey before, which acts like your screener, to be really clear about who your persona is uh, that you're that you're lo looking to learn from. And each of your interviews should be the same persona. So you don't want to be asking, you know, if, if I'm if I'm interviewing um, expecting mothers, I don't want to be doing interviews on women who had have already had birth or or the partners of people who are having birth. Those are really important people for me to talk to, but not in this interview set. OK, this interview set is just for expecting mothers. And I think it's another error that folks, um, you know, often encounter is they, you know, think, think of some interview questions and then just go out and ask people that will listen. <laughs> um, but it's really important for you to, to ask the same persona, um, the same questions across six folks so that you can really identify those top level or base level themes. Like I mentioned, forums, groups, professional associations, great places to find participants. You might need to ask someone uh, who runs a newsletter or actually pay for some social media ads to get these folks and participants recruited. Do what you need to do. Set aside a small budget. It shouldn't take more than a couple hundred bucks and the insights are worth it. Um, before the interview, You'll want to select the survey respondents based on a certain set of criteria. Then we'll reach out to those folks. Um, I would, I would, you know, script what that interview looks like. We've got, we've got a couple of um, templates if you're interested. Schedule some time blocks. We like using Calendly, so it's easy for the person to find time in their schedule. And that's oftentimes the biggest reason for someone to reject an interview request. It's because they don't have time. So offering them multiple um, slots is super important in conversion. Writing the script ahead of time and keeping that script the same throughout the entire time and documenting those responses is critical. We use a transcription service called rev.com. Um, there's also TLDR there, or TLDB, um, uh, Otter AI. There's a, there's a bunch out there, um, but, and I think actually, um, yeah, you, you like you like Rev too, Reggie. Um, I think Zoom does this too. It, it might have already added this feature um, to get the transcripts as well. So when you're writing the script, and this goes to what your point before was, Reggie, is the the questions you ask inform the answers you get. So it's really important to to think about what was covered in the surveys and not ask necessarily the same questions because you want to be sensitive with your time so don't be repetitive with with the things you're going out and, and and asking about try to find try to dig deeper in these interviews that's what they're there for um gave you a note on number more than six is okay but definitely less than 12 um in terms of questions um don't lead the interview allow them to kind of lead the interview and and uh, while you have a script and you have to get through a certain number of those questions, it's really important for, for you to give space and silence is a really great tool in that regard. Just a nice long pause after someone's provided a response is enough for them to, to oftentimes either fill that gap because they're nervous uh, or because they expect you to say more or because something else occurs to them. Um, and, and, and do your best to try to break it down into sections. So if you have a, a 12 question script, you'll maybe break it into three blocks. Here's what we're covering in the first block. Here's what we're covering in the second block. And here's what we're covering in the third block. It helps the respondent and you um, in digesting the information shared. One thing I want to, just an anecdote I want to add on to this. Particularly yeah, this is your expertise. With, with, yeah, particularly with the don't lead follow. Um, and it kind of calls back to some of what we talked about before, which is the like requirement to remove your ego when going through this process. So yeah. like seven or eight years ago with my first business, you know, 
we couldn't get very far because we created a product that we tried to make for three unique audiences all with the exact same product. And so we were constantly struggling with how to ever talk about it because each audience had a different use case for it. Yeah. Um, but I remember doing in, in doing some of these interviews, going down this path that you're, propo- you're, you're, you're talking about here, but then still not doing enough to like hedge against myself and if I wasn't getting like the answer I thought I was gonna get, I would ask like that same question like three more times with three different ways. And even, and even if it still didn't come out, I'd be like, okay, but what about this? And then they'd be like, oh, I guess, yeah. And then I'm like, okay, great. So I got the answer I was looking for. So you've gotta like really protect yourself from yourself in this process to make sure that just cause you think something, and I think it goes back to, it's a hypothesis as opposed to an assumption, right? Yeah. If you take on that mindset of it's a hypothesis, then you do a better job of protecting yourself from yourself in the interview process. So that way you're not like, if you don't get the answer you, you thought you were going to get, you don't just start asking it other ways to hopefully almost trick them into giving you the right response that you're looking for. Amen. And thank you for sharing that vulnerable story, Rajiv. <laughs> I, I've, I've been there myself and I think there's a lot of folks on the call who have also been there. Um, yes, that that's that's what I was referring to before around selling on the call. You don't want to be selling. You just want to be inquiring. You want to be curious. You want to be interested. Okay. You don't want to be trying to elicit a specific response. And if you don't hear the response you were expecting, that's critical. (laughs) Um, That means there's a chance you might be spending or believing in something that doesn't, that shouldn't exist or now isn't the right time. Um, And so you know, I, I, I think of myself sometimes as like, you know, a little Christian children's foundation or, or like one of these, you know, rescue organizations for founders where I'm uh, of like, I've saved you from five years of spending your life doing something that no one wants or, or investing more money in a product that's not going to turn you, you, you know, around to work. And that's a good thing. Knowing when to stop and step away is just as strong of a muscle as when to invest as a founder. All right, now we're in the interview, so I'm gonna to try to run through this because we only got a few minutes left. Um, best practices, do a tech check. Don't have more than two folks on the call because it kind of creates a little bit of a group dynamic and pressure. Um, take notes, even though there's a transcription uh, service working in the background, it's important for you live to be tracking the energy on the call um, and, 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 and writing down things that, that come to mind. It's not just important for posterity, but for you to be an active listener in the whole process as well. Um, Be consistent in the questions that you're asking across each interview. Um, Focus on the current context and consider the timestamps as you're working through it. Okay, after the interview, um, immediately after, give yourself some like five minutes and use a forces diagram. I'm I'm gonna show you this template in a second but it basically it's a quadrant diagram that shows you push, pull, actions, and anxieties, which are the things, like these are the reasons why people buy things or, or change their behavior as human beings. Um, schedule an internal synthesis for yourself and to share information with your team because it can't just live in your head. It needs to be in the whole team's head so everyone can be making decisions with the user in mind uh, and transcribe and document. Most folks don't document. Most folks will... It, you know, if you're going through this process, you're like, yeah, I did the interviews. And I'm like, okay, so where's the report of the interviews? So that your, your, your next hire can read it or your developer can read it or your investor can read it or you can read it. Your future you five years from now can look back at that. And so if there's one thing I'll, I'll leave you with in this, you know, this goddamn presentation is please document. Um, please document these interviews and synthesis. You'll look back and be like, why, why the hell are we going in this direction? There's something in the interviews that pointed us over this way. And then you'll be able to look back at the report and, and recognize and chart that trajectory. Spoke a little bit about the subject matter expert interviews. Conduct them in a very similar way. They don't have to be as formal. Um, and folks, you know, the persona is going to vary quite a, you know, a large degree between these interviews. We're, we're going to be talking to academics, who have been researching the future of, 
uh, this landscape. You're going to be talking to veterans who have been in this industry for 10, 20 years and seen it evolve. You're going to be talking to founders who have started the company you're trying to start three or four years ago and failed. Why was that? You know, talk to all of these people and be curious. Um, one thing I'll notice is folks will be afraid of talking to competitors or, or, or people that are in a, the same industry or vertical. And to that, I say, who cares? Um, if, if some trade secret comes out on the call, you know, it's not going to be the call that, you know, it, and, and you're probably going to be so guarded on the call, it doesn't matter. But you do need to be networking. You do need to be talking to these people and learning from each other. If you're truly passionate about the product or service you're bringing to the market, it needs to exist in the world. And there's another person out there that is also trying to make it exist in the world. How beautiful it is that you found that person and have the ability to talk to them and learn. Um, so, so don't ignore that just because of your ego. Um, okay. Data gathering. So now we're diving into secondary research. Um, and I'm moving on a clip. Uh, a fast clip here, Reggie, forgive me. Um, so we'll want to uh, do a few things, understand the market size, understand direct competitors, um, understand unsuccessful attempts, right? There's there's a whole website called the Startup Graveyard. Um, it's our best friend. We like we, we have them on auto dial, right? Like those are the most important people who have charted your path before. Um, understanding where funding and acquisitions are going. You know, if there's if there's a company that's raised 50 million, you know, two years ago or three years ago and hasn't raised another round or isn't looking like they're succeeding, that's an indicator for you. If you're if you are noticing there's a competitor that just um, got rolled up, you know, three companies just merged into one, you know, you should you should be on the lookout. Like there's going to be something coming from that from that company a PE play of some sort, most likely. So understanding where funding and acquisitions and mergers are all happening is super important. And then creating what we like to call this branding matrix or competitive matrix that includes features and brand components. Because we found, you know, being designers, we found that, right, like what's the difference between Casper and Sleepies? It's their brand. It's the same. It's a very similar market. It's the way that they went to market and the branding that made a lot of the difference for them. So um, make sure you're charting that when you're looking across the landscape as well. All right. Two more minutes. Here we go. Most people think of an MVP as the, the triangle on the left. It's reliable and functional. It's like a, a shitty version of the thing you ultimately want to build. That's not an MVP. An MVP, a real good MVP, takes a slice off of each of these layers. And, and, and when you're thinking about um, a prototype, it's important that you're not thinking about your MVP. A lot of people would be like, oh, we're going to the MVP and really you should be thinking about prototyping before you go to the MVP. Always be prototyping. You don't want to be always be building another MVP because that's just building software and that, it's not as helpful. It's creating tech debt, et cetera. Um, and, and you'll notice how thin and, 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 and slim this slice is. Um, it doesn't need to be reliable. It doesn't need to be functional but it does need to be meaningful and convenient and pleasurable and slightly usable in order for them to uh, elicit a reaction. Um, that's my note for this is to optimize for reactions. Uh, we ran a test for a travel recommendation company um, and they were, they were building an app to get recommendations from friends. Instead of building an interface that looks like the app, um, what we decided to do was use WhatsApp and use WhatsApp groups and kind of eavesdrop on the WhatsApp groups amongst friends. We recruited what we called like the, the pod leader that would then recruit six of their friends. We would eavesdrop and watch how recommendation conversations would go within that thread. And what we learned was people weren't willing to pay for the recommendation app outright, but when the group wasn't able to give them a recommendation, they were willing to pay for an expert to come in and offer a recommendation in that thread. We would have never understood that if we didn't understand the dynamics within the recommendation itself. So prototyping isn't, isn't making something that looks like the real, uh, the real thing. It's about finding a way to elicit the right reaction. Okay. Once you've got all of the features that you're really excited about, here's a quick prioritization matrix. Impact on the vertical axis, 
effort on the horizontal. When I'm doing this in my head, I always forget which is on which. The impact is an I, so that should be vertical. So that's the one you're gonna put on the vertical. Capital E has the horizontal slants on it. Effort should go on the, on the uh, X axis. Um, you'll start in the top left quadrant and move clockwise around it and then stop once you get to the lower right or lower right quadrant, right? So you're starting with high impact and low effort features, getting them uh, out, building momentum. Then you shift into high effort, high impact features. And all of a sudden, once you're done with that, two or three months has passed and your priorities are different. So you're going to rechart everything again. You'll never really want to be working on the things that are high effort and low impact or low effort and low impact. This is a great prioritization framework that we use on a daily basis. All right. This looks like something out of the Ozarks uh, TV show logo. I know it's a terrible diagram. You wouldn't believe I'm a designer, but take your assumptions, throw them into your phone or a list, build the list of assumptions. Once you have the assumptions, form a hypothesis and focus it around a business impact and a specific person. Take that hypothesis, define a research program using interviews and surveys to learn more about that hypothesis. Build a prototype or something that you can put in front of a person to elicit strong reactions and then um, focus on the insights you gather from that test in, in, a, in an effort and impact lens. I know I had to rush through those last few, but I'd love to just learn in the chat, if you wouldn't before you sign off, one thing that you're taking away from in this, uh, in this presentation um, that I can, that'll help me sleep tonight. And if you have, if you do have any question you wanna ask, we can, we got another minute or so, we can stick around to uh, answer any of those questions. Go, uh, DJ, go, you can just come off mute, DJ, go ahead. Hey, all right, this has been a great, Great presentation. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, question is real basic. Maybe you covered it. How do you determine if the persona that you selected is the right persona? Are you just taking a guess and then going from there? Or, yeah, okay. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to, that's where the gut comes in, right? You have to choose one persona. The way you define the persona is important, though. And the way that we define personas is based on another framework called the Jobs to Be Done framework or JTBD. Um, or DB done, job to be done. Um, JTBD. <laughs> dyslexia it pops up all over the place. Um, and the jobs to be done framework is fantastic um, to understand what someone is expecting to get from a specific moment, what pain they're feeling at that moment, and what what the gain will be. So pains and gains is what we have, and then some habits and 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 things that they're doing on a regular basis because that's that's where we'll find these people out in the world. I also think um, one thing I want to add as well, when you're showing the pyramid, right, of like what your prototype should be, what your MVP should be. And I think, you know, this is to borrow from a writer who I, a thought leader who I uh, really respect and read a lot of their work around category design thinking, um, the category pirates and Christopher Lockhead. And one of the things they say is like, I mean, and they, they talk about like, you know, don't even think about it as an MVP um, because it kind of leads you to create a terrible product just because you think it's supposed to be minimal. And, and what he says, he goes, just, just replace product with any other word for something in your life. Would you ever go see a minimum viable doctor, right? <laughs> would, you, right? would you ever go drive a minimum viable car? And he's like, and, that, and, and so when people, founders, they, they think minimum viable product and they're like, oh, What's the worst thing I could put in front of someone? And because it's an MVP, it'll work because they understand it's bad. It doesn't work like that. Absolutely. And I think that MVP is oftentimes divorced from this thought process, the mindset of testing. Your, your MVP is just a part of you testing. It's not, you know, the thing that you want to be wedded to and then continue to develop over time. It's the thing that you get out there to learn from. And if you can always hold the, lot, the mindset of learning, um, that, then you'll be able to keep your ego in check, make better decisions, and people will like you more. <laughs> yeah. And then one other thing I think I, I, I wanted to share as well is like um, this idea around figuring out, like, you know, you talk about like observe what, what's been done in the market before, and right? let that help inform some of your decision making. I think it's not just what other products have been created. 
But what I have, what I run into a lot with, with some founders is like, you have to recognize whatever, you know, let's say a company got to a certain level and then now, and, and then they became evil or whatever, right? They didn't set out to be evil, most likely. And so what were the conditions or what were the things that made them have to make those choices and force them to become that kind of a company? Because it's not just like, you can be like, oh, we're going to build X, but we're not going to do it the way they did it. But they probably didn't set out to do it that way. It's just that things required them to make those changes. So you really got to be able to look through that lens as well. Like when scale happened, what forced them to go in this path that maybe I haven't even considered yet? And, and here I am thinking, oh, they just solved the wrong problem. But maybe that's not it. They learned something along the way that you haven't encountered. Yeah. Um, I think so. So DJ said, big takeaway, use subject matter interviews as a way to learn, but also to get to know future advisors and investors. I think that's great. Yep. Uh, Brett said the three pyramids, um, product MVP and prototype was really good. I like that as well. Um, and then Razi has just got a question. Yeah, Razi, you're, you're, you nailed it. Yeah, your intuition is spot on. It's, it's just repeat. And that's why I love this model is as long as you're understanding how to get this into a cycle, your business is like very likely to succeed. You're, you're going to be a, a successful entrepreneur. You know, like I wish I had been operating this for 10, 20 years and I had like a wealth of stats uh, to back that claim, but it's just the church that I'm, you know, I'm a part of right now and I'm building. It's just, it feels so right and true to me. <laughs> and remember, I, you kind of casually mentioned it, but it's a site I never knew existed. Startupgraveyard.io. Uh, I am bookmarking that site now. <laughs> Um, so appreciate it, Nick. This was awesome. I think everyone on here will corroborate that. This was really valuable. Um, we're going to get the, the recording sent out once I can upload this to YouTube. Um, and then do they get a copy of the slides as well or no? Yep. Yep. I'll share the deck um, in the next couple of days uh, along with the link to the video. Right on. All right, everybody. Go forth and build good products. And you've got Nick as a resource now and further faster as a resource. Yes. To help yeah. You. Find me on LinkedIn. We'd love to, to chat with folks. This is what I love. All right, guys. Have a Thank great you. rest of the day. Thanks, DJ. Later. Bye.